dust. Let's move the rear end there. <laughs> How's everybody doing? So I just, uh, this is going to be something of a little bit different nature, but it's definitely related to, uh, no Dusty, it's not related to you, but okay, have your say. Yeah. Anyway, um, this is seemingly unrelated, but actually it's related to a lot of the things that I want to share and teach about paint and weathering uh, that apply directly to trains. And I just found that a larger scale model would be the best way to demonstrate that. So there, there has been requests, you know, about uh, somebody saw sort of the Kenworth model on the side there in one of the videos. And I'd been already shooting video in the summertime. So uh, I'm taking a rest right now building turnouts like uh, i've already done that and, and uploaded a tutorial so i don't want to bore people with that but they have to be built in order for me to move forward on river road so i thought i would insert a short series on uh, the build-up of this model or talk about it a little bit anyway and use it as a larger scale so i can demonstrate more clearly uh, some of the, you know, some of the methods that I use to weather that I also use to weather uh, locomotives and rolling stock. Okay, so uh, before I get started here, I just want to make a couple of things clear. Uh, I think if uh, I could uh, reform any of my past content in terms of my communication, it would be that very thing. Uh, I probably need to be, you know, think it through a bit more and be a little more thorough because... If there's a misinterpretation about what I say, uh, I have to take blame for that or at least be accountable because it's up to me to communicate exactly what's going on with the channel moving forward. Like, like it's easy to say things through social media, you know, with uh, no body language or no real sentient there, like no real connection to the human being. Uh, when you communicate where you can sort of correct on the fly and so on you can't do that with social media you have to sort of do damage control later and i don't want that to happen too often like i know it occurs and i understand that so if somebody you know says the something that gets taken the wrong way like don't worry about it like just communicate it you know like on the channel and and i'll get to it and uh you know we'll just move forward like that's understandable we all do that so anyway the reason why I'm doing this model is twofold. One is I always wanted to build a logging truck. It, you know, I mean, who doesn't like a Kenworth, right? Uh, especially from the 70s, you know. Um, and two is, is it's the best format, the, you know, like this, for example, AMT 125th scale, to demonstrate all my, my painting and weathering and kit bashing and super detailing methodology. Like, it's really hard like you can transfer the skills when you learn them to any scale, but it's much easier to do it in larger scale, which is why when I was in film, we built super huge models like quarter scale and models that are 12 feet long because they're easier to build. <laughs> like they're easier to photograph, they're easier to light and uh, they just look more realistic, right? And so nothing is any different like the way i painted full scale or large scale models in film is the same way i would probably paint an end scale locomotive like there's no real difference it's just that the actually ratio of application is more micro right so if i want to demonstrate techniques that i use it's much easier to photograph and uh to uh show them with a larger scale model. So I'm not going to do this series like all the way through and finish the model right now because I don't want to uh, deviate away from River Road. Like that, like River Road is my primary focus. This is not a distraction. It's a tool to enhance the journey on River Road for all of you and to help flesh out in a preliminary sense what's happening and what is going to happen because there's going to be a lot of painting and scenery and how I do my track like this is unique this approach too because I'm going to be laying down the turnouts once I finish building these and I'm going to be painting them right in place with an airbrush uh, at low pressure so I think a lot of people will be excited to see that because that's what really gives that look that a lot of people ask about how do you paint your track and so I hear all your comments I write them down uh, even though I don't agree with all of them, <laughs> I'm willing to make concessions because 
everything that everybody brings to the game is legitimate and fair. And, uh, you know, we have different ways of doing things. And just to close on that, to move forward, uh, just following this is just a little segment I want to share with you that I had an issue back in my museum days where I was building a, well, I was going to build a large model of the of the Bismarck. So I, I'm, I'm a real stickler for research and trying to get the color right. And there was a lot of people that were going on and on, you know, unfounded claims about the color of the Bismarck prior to her sinking. I got that all straightened out because I got a hold of the primary source. I'll just share that with you. What is its relevance? At the end of the day, it's just do your own research, get your own photograph, pick the locomotive you want to paint or subject or whatever. And if you're happy with the research you have in hand, then just paint from that. But don't worry about people that want to push paint chip, you know, cult on you and stuff like that. Just, you know, everything is subjective, right? Because of lighting, scale, physics, you know, weather, you know, so I'm not going to be getting into that like down the road. So if you want to stress, oh, the color's not right, the grass is too green or the rust shade isn't right, that's fine. You can share that, but I'm not going to stress over that. I'm not going to give that, you know, like a whole lot of attention because I just want to move forward and have fun, right? Like everybody. Okay. Okay, so I just want to insert this, even though it might seem unrelated, but it helps to stress my point about color, about why I don't get hung up on paint chips. You know, this idea, like, let me just give you an example. Like, I get it if someone says, well, this is Norfolk Southern Black, or this is Conrail Blue. Like, I get that as a base or a start, but I don't get hung up on that stuff. I never have. Besides, when you model and scale, like, you go from the prototype, it might have an RLM 507 or something. But then when you paint it in the model, everything changes. Physics, lighting, it, there's so many variables. And to actually put the actual paint chip from the prototype onto the model doesn't make any sense to me at all. Okay? And I'll just give you an example. Like when I was researching the Bismarck, I built se several models of her. And I wanted to get, solve this or settle the argument where there was a, a group of people that were arguing that the tops of the turrets on the Bismarck were yellow, were painted yellow during her sinking. And they went on and on about it. They didn't have anything to back it up but their own opinion, right? So in this book right here, Battleship Bismarck, written by Burkhardt Baron von Maltheim Reckberg, who was the first gunnery officer on the Bismarck when she was sunk and he survived, Okay, he's deceased now, but I, through another person, acquired this personal letter by him. Okay, this is a photocopy of it. And I wanted to settle this and put this whole silly controversy to rest. And this is just to demonstrate about how important it is to do research when it comes to color and to not get hung up on it because Mulnheim Reckbird described Turret Dora as just being a beautiful gray when he slid into the North Sea when the Bismarck was listing. And here, look at Regarding the principal issue of your message, I'm afraid that I cannot confirm the Bismarck's turret roofs ever having been painted yellow at all. My own recollection is that when on 27th of May, 1941, at the end of the final battle, I left my battle station, I had to pass turret C and D. C was in a beautiful color, light gray, all over. D, battle scarred, part dark grayish, part black from battle effects, no yellow to be seen anywhere. Okay, so that settles the whole argument to anyone that might care about it, that you do the research. And here's the signature right here at the bottom of the letter. That's how this gentleman right here, this is his signature right here. Most respectfully yours, Monheim. Okay, so... So much for that, right? So I don't get too hung up on, uh, you know, paint chip, you know, colors and theories like people do. And besides, those people that do that, show me your model. 
first. Like, show some credibility, show me your model, and then let's talk about it. Anyway, thanks for allowing me to share that because it's important even when it comes to model railroading and when painting scenery and things like where people might say, oh, the grass is too green, you know, or something like this, okay? So this uh, episode, maybe short series, is going to be about advanced weathering with water-based paints, and in this case, there'll be model air. Okay, so this isn't going to be about airbrushing, because airbrushing, as important as it is, is only part of the process. Okay. But a lot of times, you know, with airbrushing, for me, I mean, I can only share it from my experience. Like, I don't have a paint booth or, or a studio or a shop like I used to. You know, I'm semi-retired now, and I live in a smaller building, and or home and uh, you know I, I just function now uh, from you know I sort of shoot from the hip I always have like when I had the luxury of a great shop Wow you know but I don't but I, that doesn't stop me you know and it shouldn't stop any modeler um, you know if we love to model we just find a way to do it right uh, regardless and it's probably a priority in our life other than our families and God and country, you know, but, um, so I like to do most of my painting at the desk or the bench like this, you know, uh, for the most part, because this is where all the real magic kind of happens, you know? Um, so let me begin then. So, like you can see this subject here this is an AMT 125th Peerless Roadrunner logging bunk trailer and I'll just mention about the kit quickly it's a fantastic kit like this scale the reason why I've chosen this scale like why isn't he doing it in HO well I have a lot of content in HO but in order for me to demonstrate uh, this particular process or style of weathering because there are many uh, it's much easier to do uh, on a larger scale model, right? And if most of you, you know, are model railroaders, you've probably had some exposure to other models in the past. You know, like I don't just model, like I've modeled every scale there is. Like I've modeled scales that are not even listed when I was in film. When we built like, you know, space shuttle models, you know, whatever stuff like that for soundstage, for pyrotechnics and all that other stuff before... Like that was the early 90s before CGI took over. We had a lot of fun, right? We built things in what was called quarter scale, where three inches equals a foot. That's the true quarter scale. Not, I'm not talking about 148 scale, where it's a quarter inch to the foot. Quarter scale, or three quarter scale, is another term, is where the three inches on a ruler is actually one foot in the model. So you can imagine, you know, the, the beauty and the detail of scale. I mean, I'll show you one quick clip of a shuttle that I worked on that we built in quarter scale. So, you know, uh, you learn a lot in the larger format, like you learn a lot in the larger scale because everything is larger by ratio and uh, this is a really beautiful scale to model in for those that are just starting out or even th those that are veterans and experienced you know you should take a break and try one man all the skills you've acquired and developed over the years and now you can really put it to practice on a larger scale model and they look really stunning when you work them over good uh, I'm really, really enjoying this project. Yes, I love HO scale and model railroading, but I want to break for a bit. And uh, it all pans out in the end and all transfers to uh, model railroading and the different scales anyway. Because it's all about technique and experience, right? Okay, so let me just begin then with... So this bunk is almost there. It's almost finished. And you can see I have the wheels here. And then this is the bunk that goes on the back of the tractor frame. 
So this has been airbrushed in rail brown, okay? So the airbrush phase is the first part. So this was white plastic originally, so I airbrushed the whole thing in the dark rail brown, which is black and brown, 50-50, give or take. All right, don't get fussy. You don't need paint chip numbers for this, okay? And then what I did was is I also added some orange. Like, I like to mix my own colors. That's what happens when you're painting for a long time. You just mix your own shades and colors. So I sprayed another just lighter tone of lighter rust but you can just spray earth too like just a light dusting just put two coats with your airbrush on the model first that you want to weather to start okay that's what this was initially you can see i've left most of it on the bottom but it does have some washes i need to do a little bit of work here but not too much though because once again like it's the illusion right like the shadow see I leave it darker because nobody really looks at that part of the model anyway. I mean, I don't even have much weathering under here. I mean, I'll clean that up a bit, but I want to leave this dark because when the model's actually sitting on, on a display base, a piece of wood or a diorama, you, you don't want the same color tones underneath here as you do on the top because we simulate light and shadow, right? That's the whole point of washes and dry brushing. Okay, so this was airbrushed just like this with Tamiya, and then what I did was is I put a, a coat of Dull Coat. I sprayed this down with Tester's Dull Coat, which I like to use flat. You can see it's it's not totally flat. It's got a little bit of a sheen, very subtle sheen. That's why I like Tester's Dull Coat because it's not super super flat. But see how the light sh reflects off it. So that's what I did with this. And then the first layer that I'm going to put on this, or on this one in this case, is going to be water. Okay. Like I'll start here in this I-beam. I'm just going to soak this down with water. And I'll show you with these wheels as well. Like these have just been sprayed rail brown as well, like this. And then I just dusted with uh, gray, a light gray first, and then a white, but way back. A sort of tinted white, not pure white. You use pure white. If you're going to use pure white, you just use it at the very last stage to, to pick off the nuts and bolts and stuff. Okay which I tend to use oils at that point because it doesn't kill the brush so much and it stays wet, the paint, in a sense, even when it's, you know, very minimal on the brush. So even with these, I'll just fill them full of water, okay? And I'll show you this one first. So I'm going to take this burnt umber. So this is the color that I use first, the first wash over this color, which is really close, right? But it's all gradual layers and filters built up, right? And it ends up being seven, eight, nine layers, maybe even more, uh, in the, uh, including uh, gloss coats, flat coats, or whatever, which I don't always use, by the way. I don't always flat coat my models, because when you do flat coat a model, it'll, it'll knock down some layers of medium, like pastels especially, and uh, even... Um, acrylic paints to a certain degree but I find that these ones here in Tamiya have such a strong pigment that they don't get knocked down um, much uh, when you dull coat them okay so I'll just uh, show you what I do with these wheels here with this burnt umber okay now, burnt umber has got kind of a red hue to it. And I'll also be using this sand color as well on, on this bunk for a preliminary wash. I'll talk about that in a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wet these wheels down like I did the first one. Soak the whole wheel down. Don't worry about lots of water because it's all going to run down the bottom through these rims anyway. Okay. 
I like to put water in first just to loosen up some of that surface tension. And then keep water on the side, lots of water. Back in the day when I learned to weather and paint, when I was, in, I guess in my teens, the Verlinden way it was called. I don't have that magazine handy, but I'll have to show it to you maybe in a later episode. But it was all oil paints and humbral enamels. Stinky paint. Oh, that paint. I mean, now when I think about it, it was fantastic paint. I'll give you, give you that. Like any of those hobby paints, like Humbrol especially, had a beautiful color line, all from England. And they just even, I, I mean, I'll confess, I even have a few bottles or tins in my paint kit because I, I like their uh, raw umber, their red browns and stuff. And if I want to paint a particular plastic part, enamel so that isopropyl will be impervious to it or pardon me enamel will be impervious to isopropyl when i cut through layers there'll always be that humbral protective layer underneath if it does show through it won't cut to the white plastic like in this case here but but now that i use these uh acrylic paints water-based i've really grown to love them so i'm just going to take a bit of this now and I'm just going to stab it in there, see? Now remember, you can always restore the white later. And uh, as long as you're, you're, you're doing thin washes, you're not going to get any paint built up. But I kind of want that. See that how it's all the, the rust there is? Because these hubs are going to be dark brown, kind of rusted, but not the rims. And I want that to pool, pool in there, like around the nuts there. So I'm just going to let that dry like that, and I'll do the rest like that. Again, we want to lay in a filter, and this is the, the color that I like to use in the beginning of the process, because it lays a good foundation for the colors to follow. Some of these rims are going to have even more rust than the others. I've noticed that on trucks. And another thing that should be mentioned too, like have a source of photographs. Study the photographs. I put them away when I paint now, but that's just probably from experience. But study them and, um, you know, ask yourself, why does it do what it does? And see, and you can wick out some of the paint too, right? So that, that's a good start for these rims. I mean, they already look pretty good, don't they? That's just one little dab of burnt umber and water over to me a white or gray base, okay? So I'm just going to let those dry. I'm going to set those aside. And then what I'm going to do here is, is I'm just going to lay in. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to lay in the umber yet. I'm going to put in, watch this. I'm going to coat this whole piece with sand. Just a wash of sand. And I really like sand because sand as a primary filter or layer will bleed through some of the other layers. Okay. Um, now the key with this paint is, is to stay with it. Like don't put a blob of paint on and then run it out to the phone or something, you know. Um, you know, otherwise it'll stain and you'll have trouble removing it. And if, and if you have to use isopropyl to remove the flood mark or the stain or the blob, you're gonna cut right through all of these layers. Okay, so start with the bottom here. So just lay some water in here and don't worry if it beads away like it will like see, see it won't stick there. It'll just pool up and then just stab in some color like that. That's quite a bit, but this is enough here to move around the whole model probably on the bottom. So I just want to just spread it around. Let it build up a, a very light coat just like spilled milk right 
spill the paint on. So you don't want to let this dry like that, see? If you let that dry, that's what, what it'll look like when you come back to it. And you won't be able to move it again with water. So lots of water. I'll probably use a larger brush here, but I'll just stick with this one. Now some would say, oh, why is he putting a light coat? Isn't he, isn't he supposed to put a dark coat to go into all the cracks first? or last or later or whatever uh, no I mean you're right in thinking that way but that comes later this is just a filter this will get blackened out anyway when it dries You look at some if you google up pictures of these log bunks the peerless ones this is the way that they got all kinds of different shades and you'll see too like on the peerless they were originally blue see see the blue paint here they were darker than this though but i'm not going to put darker blue on here i mean even though there might be a, a filter a darker blue filter hiding in there is is it it the paint faded over the years see and there'd be more in behind here where it doesn't get rubbed by the logs coming down all the time and you know just a little hint of blue left over and a little bit left on the on the boom as well i even put pink in here and flesh see but that'll get a few coats see so you know flesh you know flesh is another color that people oh i just use you know Flesh is only good for figures. No, it isn't. Flesh is fantastic for wood. If you're going to lay a base color of wood down and put washes over top. Flesh is a color that many people overlook. And it's a color that if you use it in some of your models, people are going to say, how did you get that look? What color is that? It's a type of mauve, you see. So you can see we got quite a bit pooling off here, but that's okay. You know, a lot of this too, like, you know, when you have like anomalies and, and like issues, don't worry about it. You can fix them later. Okay. Like as long as it's not too major, like a big blob of paint. Okay, so when this dries, it's going to have a bit of a fade to the metal, to this raw, raw umber look. Okay. You just want to keep playing with it. See how it fades, how it blends? Just poke, or just poke away at it. Have fun with it. 